my daughter as Her Excellency Senator Luremi Tinubu pays condolence visit. Digital technology to play a key role in empowering youth employment as federal government unveils one million job creation plan. Nigerian Petroleum Regulatory Commission warns of impending gas supply crisis amid rising domestic demand. World Bank approves $500 million loan for Nigeria's sustainable power and irrigation project. On the foreign scene, United Nations appeals for peace as clashes erupt in Khartoum with Sudanese military targeting RSF-controlled areas. Sports Minister Senator Eno charges National Sports Federation on effective service delivery. Hello, good evening and welcome to the news at 7. I am Mariam Zakari. Now the details. Okoibom State Governor Pastor Umo Eno has declared that the office of the First Lady will remain active with his eldest daughter, Mrs. Helen Eno Obareki, at the helm. The initiative is aimed at upholding the legacy of his beloved wife, late Pastor Mrs. Patience Eno. Governor Umoeno, who disclosed this during a condolence visit from the wife of the president, Senator Luremi Tinubu, at the government house in Uyo, assured that his administration will uphold and expand the visions and programs initiated by the Office of the First Lady. ADBN correspondent Mary Onyemachi tells us more. The government house in Uyo saw a significant gathering of dignitaries who came to offer their condolences to the governor and the people of the state following the passing of the first lady. Governor Umoina, on the occasion, expressed his gratitude to Senator Oluremi Tinubu, the wife of the president, for her support and motherly kindness during this time of grief, reaffirming his commitment to supporting the success of President Tinubu's administration. And I've said it in very unmistakable terms that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm working hand in hand with the federal government under the leadership of Asha Bola to support the work and to ensure that we all support him as he leads Nigeria through this turbulent period. For anybody who has cared to listen, my people already know my stand. And because of the love and care we have enjoyed, we thank you and want to please ask that you help extend our woman's appreciation to our father, the President and Commander-in-Chief. In her condolence message, the First Lady, Senator Oluremi Tinibu, described the late First Lady, Pastor Mrs. Patience Eno, as a woman of peace and purpose, devoted to enhancing the lives of her community. The country's First Lady also pledged her ongoing support for the state government and the legacies of the late First Lady of Akwaibom State. We've been up that God knows where to call everybody home. She has finished her course. Despite the want her to stay behind, God will comfort you, sir. Comfort you, the children. And what she couldn't finish, you will finish. I've been talking to your dad. We will help your dad and support your dad. I will be here for you. You know, your mom was a great woman. And I'm honored to have met her. The First Lady, Senator Oluremi Tinibu, was joined by the wife of the Vice President, Alaja Nana Shetima, the wife of the Senate President, Her Excellency, Mrs. Ikaite Unoma Akmabio, as well as the wives of current ministers and state governors, amongst others. During the event, the wife of the president also signed the condolence register. Mary Onyemichi, ADBN News. Meanwhile, President of the Senate, Senator Godzilla Pabu, has paid tribute to the former First Lady of Akwaibom State, late Pastor Mrs. Patience Eno, describing her as a symbol of unity and stability. During a condolence visit to the governor, Umo Eno at the government house, Senator Akpabi expressed his heartfelt sympathy 
emphasizing her dedication to the welfare of Akwaibom state people. He acknowledged her vital role in supporting the ongoing Akwaibom project and noted the significant impact of her contributions. Senator Pabi also conveyed condolences from President Bola Tinubu, assuring the governor of ongoing federal support for the state. In a press briefing, he highlighted that his visit was both a Senate president and a former governor reflecting his deep ties to the state and its residents. Moving on, the federal government has revealed plans to create 1 million jobs to combat youth unemployment across all 774 local government areas in the country. Minister of State for Youth Development, Comrade Ayodele Olawande, during the disclosure emphasized government's commitment to educating, inspiring, and connecting Nigerian youth with careers and opportunities in the insurance sector through digital technology. He also highlighted government's goal to boost youth participation in the insurance industry aimed at creating jobs and enhancing financial inclusion. This initiative follows the Rural Electrification Agency's announcement that from November, the federal government will launch a new rural electrification project funded by the World Bank, aiming to provide electricity to 17.5 million Nigerians. And to the energy sector, stakeholders have projected that Nigeria could face a gas supply shortfall of 3.1 billion cubic feet per day within the next six years, except urgent measures are taken to upgrade gas infrastructure and boost investments in renewable energy. At the Nayak Energy Conference 2024 in Lagos, stakeholders estimated that the country will require approximately $20 billion annually to address its infrastructure deficits. Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Professor Benga Komolafe, stated that, stated that domestic demand for gas is currently outpacing supply, primarily due to improved domestic supply obligations represented by Director of the Lagos Regional Office, Professor Komolafe, indicated that gas demand is projected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 16.6%, warning of an impending gas supply crisis by 2030 under the base case demand and supply scenario. He emphasized that the NUPRC aims to create a conducive operative environment and encourage investors to utilize the sustainability mandates in the Petroleum Industry Act 2021, along with attractive fiscal incentives. On his part, Chief Executive Officer of the Nigeria Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority, Mr. Farouk Ahmed, represented by Director of Public Affairs, Mr. George Eneita, stressed the importance of energy security for Nigeria's economic growth, despite significant gas utilization deficits. He pointed out that Nigeria still flares about 2.5 billion cubic feet of gas daily, he assured that the NMDPRA is dedicated to fostering transparency and creating an investment-friendly environment. Meanwhile, National Space Research and Development Agency has reaffirmed its dedication to establishing Nigeria as a significant player in the global space economy. This comment was highlighted in a statement by the Director of Media and Corporate Communications at NASDA, Dr. Felix Ale. The agency's Director General, Mr. Matthew Adepoju, during recent engagements at the 79th United Nations General Assembly and the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, Global Alliance Business Association International Conference in Michigan, United States also emphasized this commitment. Mr. Adekpaju outlined a forward-thinking agenda stressing the importance of Nigeria's space program as a leader in research, exploration, and technological innovation. He underscored the necessity for strategic partnerships and emphasized that with support from the government, the international partners, and a dedicated team, NASDA is well positioned to achieve sustainable, substantial advancements in the evolving global space, land space. 
and to other stories, World Bank has approved a $500 million loan to support the sustainable power and irrigation for Nigeria's PIM project aimed at addressing climate-induced challenges. World Bank's Regional Director for Sustainable Infrastructure Development in Western Central Africa, Mr. Chakib Jenain, made the disclosure during a visit to the Minister of Water Resources and Sanitation in Abuja. He noted that the SPIN project was approved at the World Bank's board meeting on September 26 and is set to commence in January 2025. The project will tackle climate-related issues such as floods and droughts by enhancing dam safety, improving water resource management and expanding irrigation services. He stated that the initiative is expected to benefit approximately 950,000 people, including farmers and livestock breeders. Emphasizing the importance of Nigeria continuing its preparations to meet the necessary conditions for the project to be effective by January 2025 target date. The World Bank team also provided an update on the transforming irrigation management in Nigeria streaming project, which is nearing completion and discussed the sustainable urban and rural water supply sanitation hygiene so wash program, highlighting the need to involve more states in the initiative. In the meantime, Borneo State Minister of Health has officially declared a cholera outbreak in the region. During the announcement at the Eye Center, Medicare Commissioner for Health and Human Services, Professor Baba Gana, revealed that out of the 200 samples tested, 17 returned positive for cholera and attributed the outbreak to the recent flooding that has affected parts of the state. Professor Gana identified local government areas experiencing the outbreak as Jere, Mafa, Konduga, Dikwa, and Medigiri Metropolitan Council. While no fatalities have been reported, the commissioner noted a rise in cholera cases across several local government areas, particularly as neighboring states like Adamawa and Yobe are also dealing with similar outbreaks. A total of 451 suspected cases have been reported from various LGAs within 17 com with 17 confirmed positive. In response to the situation, the government has initiated immediate measures to control the outbreak with support from partners and humanitarian organizations, including the World Health Organization and Medicine Sans Frontiers MSF, which have established facilities to manage suspected cases. Additionally, approximately 400,000 vaccines have been made available to combat the outbreak. In a separate development, local divers along with officials from the Niger State Emergency Management Agency and National Emergency Management Agency have recovered 20 more bodies from the water yesterday. This follows a tragic incident where a passenger boat capsized while carrying more lead celebrants at Bajibo in Mokwa local government area of Niger State, bringing the total death, to, death toll to 36. Director General of Nsema Al Haji Abdullahi Baba Ara reported that 16 bodies, including two women and 14 men, were recovered on Wednesday and subsequently buried in Bajibo community. He said the additional 20 bodies were found on Thursday through the collaborative efforts of local divers and emergency officials. Al Haji Ara stated that search and rescue operations are ongoing in partnership with local divers and emergency management officials to locate any remaining victims. In response to the tragedy, President Bola Ahmed-Tunibu extended his condolences to the government and people of Niger State. In a statement by his special advice on information and strategy, Mr. Bayon Anuga, the president expressed sympathy for the families of the victims and prayed for the souls of the deceased. President Tinubu also instructed the National Inland Waterways Authority to investigate the recent increase in boat accidents in Niger State and nationwide and to develop strategies to address the issue. He directed NIWA to enhance surveillance of island waters to ensure public safety and to take action against boat operators violating the ban on night sailing. Similarly, Minister of Marine and Blue Economy, Mr. Adegboega Oyetola, has called on boat users to refrain from traveling at night and to avoid overloading their vessels. 
He emphasized the importance of wearing life jackets before embarking on a journey, highlighting that night travel and overcrowding are significant contributors to fertilities on the water. In a statement released by his spokesperson, Mr. Oyetala stressed the need for collective action to reduce boat accidents and urged boat users to strictly follow the water transportation code. He extended his condolences to the Niger state government and the families affected by the recent boat accident on the Bajibo River. The minister also urged the National Inland Waterways Authority to rigorously enforce the transportation code to enhance safety standards, reduce accidents and create a conducive environment for potential investors. He called on state governments, particularly those in coastal areas, to collaborate with NIWA to address the ongoing issue of accidents on the waterways. And to electoral matters, River State Governor Sir Simina Lai Fubara has foiled an attempt by the Nigerian police, led by the Deputy Commissioner of Police Operations, to take over the River State Independent Electoral Commission today. The policemen were set to have attempted to scale through the gates and strong room of the commission to cart away sensitive electoral materials meant for the conduct of Saturday's local government election in the state. However, the plots of the policemen and the DCOPS were botched with vigilant security officials alerted, principal officers of the commission and relevant. <laughs> Addressing newsmen in front of Asiak office in a bar road in Port Harcourt after an encounter with the policemen, the state governor, Satimini Lai Fubara, condemned the conduct of the police on illegal duties. Everybody is aware of the court judgment. And even the judgment, judgment as they call it, the ruling. Did the ruling specify anywhere that the election should not hold? He said, don't give voters register. What are we doing with it? Okay, police, don't provide security. Don't provide security. Is this the same thing as blocking the election? Let me say to all, all the vast indigents, everyone residing in River State, election will hold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, the Chief of Staff, the Speaker of the River State House of Assembly, State and National Assembly members alongside other stakeholders are mourning the RCEC office to ensure that the policemen do not return and that elections will go ahead as scheduled on Saturday. It will be recalled that River State Police Command stated it will not take part in the local government area's elections later for tomorrow, Saturday, 5th of October, in the light of recent court rulings. Public Relations Officer of the Command, SP Grace Iringe Koko, in a statement noted that following the restraint order from a federal high court in Abuja on the 19th of July 2024, preventing the Nigeria police force and other security during the local government election, the command will not participate in the exercise. According to the statement on the 30th of September 2024, the Federal High Court in Abuja also delivered a judgment that again prohibited the Nigeria Police Force and other security agencies from participating in the local government election. The police image maker noted that given these circumstances, the Nigerian Police Force has been advised by the false legal department that a ruling from the Federal High Court on September 30, 2024 takes precedence. She explained that an opposition party 
had earlier protested, calling for adherence to the court orders and expressing their determination to prevent any disregard for the law. The command therefore directed all area commanders, divisional police officers and tactical commanders to ensure full compliance with the judgment of the Federal High Court. SP Ringe Koko called on all citizens to remain peaceful, orderly and cooperate with law enforcement in upholding the rule of law. In Nasarawa State, a high court in Doma, headquarters of Doma local government area, in the state has extended its order prohibiting the People's Democratic Party, PDP, from holding its Congress in the state. The original restraining order was issued on the 27th of September after a motion was filed by 16 PDP members led by Senator Mohamed Ogosho Nau, Nasarawa South. The plaintiffs named the PDP as the first respondent, the PDP chairman in Nasarawa State, Mr. Francis Orogo, as the second respondent, and the State Working Committee as the third respondent. Justice Abdullah Hisham Shama granted the extension following the arguments from the legal representatives of both the plaintiffs and the respondents. Counsel for the plaintiffs, Ushaka Moody Diko, had previously requested the extension to maintain the status quo until the court reaches a final decision on the case. The judge set the next hearing for 8th of October. You are watching ADBN News at 7. You can watch us on DSTV channel 258, on Star Times channel 140, Avo TV app, Limex World TV app, and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on www.adbntv.com. Stay with us for details of more stories right after this break. In a world of overwhelming voices where everyone has different opinion on different issues, it is important that we bring the core issue to the fore. Join me, Nancy Bonigo, on Softline as we lend our voices to inform and influence your thoughts and actions. This is not just mere talk, it is an invocative program that touches the core of our existence. Heartfelt congratulations to you, distinguished Senator Goswell Obolakpabio, GCON, President of the 10th Senate, on your well-deserved conferment as the Grand Commander of the Niger, GCON. Your dedication to service has earned you this prestigious honor. Advocate Broadcasting Network celebrates you. No matter what I see, enough it make mouth heavy to talk up. That's now why people they talk. You know what thing they worry you, but you know go fit take help yourself. In this kind of situation now, what if they really no talk to her now? What if the way forward? They go bury our chairman on Thursday. Mm. We go remain here. Make we talk good, where we they see good, and where we no say we not they see good, make we also they talk up. No woman, no mother. Deserve to know the grave of his child. The bank manager, the bank executive, they are the one the government should best face. People they talk the show on Monday to Friday by 5 p.m. on top ADBN TV.
You're welcome back and now to the rest of the news. Minister of State for Education Dr. Yusuf Sununu has reaffirmed government's commitment to providing conducive teaching environments for educators in the country. He gave the assurance that the International Teachers' Day celebration in Abuja, organized by the Colleges of Education Academy Staff Union, ADBN Education Correspondent Edidion Ibanga tells us more. The Minister, Dr. Yusuf Sununu, at the International Teachers' Day celebration, emphasized crucial role of education in driving national development. He called on teachers in the country to adopt more functional educational practices, aligning with global standards to enhance impact on students. Like most countries of the world, we must shift to a more functional form of education that includes hands-on knowledge, in particular, skill for every student, in addition to literacy and numeracy. This is because both white color and blue color jobs are limited, and our graduate was begin to look beyond the job seekers to job creators. Executive Secretary Nigerian Commission of Colleges of Education, Professor Paulinus Okwele, acknowledged achievements of teachers stressing urgent need to tackle challenges facing the profession. Despite the work environment, teachers in Nigeria are very industrious and committed to producing the best students who are competing favorably with their counterparts globally. Today, if Nigeria can boast of its nationals who benefited from its educational system, and are excelling in their choosing career around the world as doctors, engineers, leaders, and innovators. It is a result of the dedication and commitment of our teachers. The event served as a platform for recognition of notable citizens who have contributed to educational growth in the country. Speaking on behalf of our Ds, Executive Secretary of Tertiary Education Trust Fund, architect Sonny Echono, pledged continued efforts to support growth and development of Nigeria's educational system. We want to express our appreciation and to renew the assurances that we will continue to dedicate our efforts to ensure that taxpayers' money that are contributed for the development of education in our country is prudently and judiciously deployed. The event featured confirmment of the Legacy Award for Educational Advancement. Outstanding students from colleges of education across the six geopolitical zones were awarded scholarships, further highlighting the day's celebration of excellence in education. A. Didion Ibanga, ADBN News. Away from that International Organization for Migration and National Emergency Management Agency have successfully repatriated 180 Nigerians who were stranded in Libya. According to a statement from NEMA, the group arrived at Murtala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos on a charter flight operated by Al Burak Airlines. Additionally, those statements that various government agencies provided humanitarian assistance to facilitate the reintegration of the returnees into the society. NEMA emphasized that the IOM continues to play a very vital role in supporting Nigerians stranded abroad highlighting the organization's commitment to protecting the rights and dignity of migrants through the latest evacuation. The returnees comprise 67 adult females, 55 adult males, 24 female children, 18 male children and 16 infants. Upon their arrival, Nigerian Immigration Service conducted biometric profiling to ensure proper documentation and support for the returnees. Let's have you know that Lagos State Government has reaffirmed its commitment to implementing effective strategies to maintain the ban on the use and sale of styrofoam food, styrofoam food containers and single-use plastic across the state. Commissioner for Environment and Water Resources, Mr. Tokumba Wahab, highlighted that Lagos generates over 13,000 tons of waste daily with a significant portion consisting of single-use plastics and styrofoam, which can take up to a thousand years to degrade. 
He also mentioned a recent study indicating the presence of microplastics in human fetuses and bloodstreams, underscoring the importance of the ban for both current and future generations. He, called, he recalled that the state government announced the ban in January 2024 to mitigate the harmful environmental and health impacts of these materials, restating the government's commitment to promote viable alternatives to styrofoam containers with, throughout the metropolis. He reiterated the government's dedication to providing a robust policy framework and urged stakeholders to devise practical actionable strategies for enforcing the ban on other single-use plastic while raising public awareness to facilitate a smooth transition. Meanwhile, National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAC, has issued a warning to bakers and table water producers in Nasarawa State to avoid unhealthy practices or face penalties. North Central Director of NAFDAC, Mr. Francis Ononiwu, stated this during a stakeholders' engagement with master bakers and members of the Association of Table Water Producers of Nigeria in Lafia. He emphasized that food and water are crucial for public health, restating the agency's commitment to ensuring that the public consumes only safe water and bread. He also reiterated NAFDAQ's priority to safeguard public health in line with their mission, urging all manufacturers of all regulated products to renew their registrations within the designated time frame to avoid sanctions. On his part, NAFDAQ's Nasara State Coordinator, Mr. Matthew Olawale, urged bakers and table water producers to ensure their registration documents are valid and refrain from willfully violating the agency's guidelines in their operations. In the meantime, Niger Delta Development Commission has cautioned against false information circulating on social media about its youth internship scheme. Scammers are currently asking Nigerian youths to submit their account numbers to receive a monthly stipend of 50,000 naira, while the NDDC has not released the final list of the beneficiaries. The registration for the scheme took place between 5th August 2024 and 31st August 2024, with the selection process ongoing. The NDDC has urged registered youths to exercise patience and beware of scammers as the scheme aims to empower 10,000 Niger Delta youths in areas such as technology, music, arts, agriculture and marine. Beneficiaries will receive a mon monthly stipend of 50,000 Naira for 12 months, hands-on entrepreneurship training and systematic monitoring and evaluation. The Commission advises the public to seek information only from its official channels, including its website and social media handles, to verify facts and report any suspicious activities to avoid falling prey to scammers. President Bola Tinubu has extended his warm wishes to former Ondo State Governor Dr. Olushegu Mimiku on the occasion of his 70th birthday. In a statement, the president, alongside family, friends and associates, expressed gratitude to God for preserving the life of esteemed medical doctor, affectionately known as Iroko. President Tinubu acknowledged Dr. Mimiko's impactful contributions to both Ondo State and the nation, highlighting his roles as a commissioner for health on two occasions, minister of housing, secretary to the Ondo State government and the governor from 2009 to 2017. President Tinubu lauded Dr. Mimiko's sacrifices and people-oriented leadership style, which have earned him recognition as a grassroots leader. He prayed for more wisdom and good health and expressed hope that Dr. Mimiko will remain actively involved in Nigeria's development and contribute to its prosperous future. A look now at the foreign scene, fresh clashes erupted in Sudan's capital in late September as the military initiated operations to regain control of areas dominated by the paramilitary rapid support forces, RSF. Local media reports indicate that the army alongside allied forces is targeting the Khatam oil refinery in Al Jaili, located approximately 70 kilometers north of the capital. Key battlegrounds also include Jebel Muya in southeastern Sudan 
and El Fasha, the capital of North Darfur, with the rainy season nearing its end. Fighting is anticipated to escalate during a speech at the UN General Assembly. Last week, Sudan's military leader urged the militias in the country to lay down their arms. Since mid-April last year, Sudan has been embroiled in a violent conflict, and according to a spokesperson from the UN Human Rights Office in Geneva, at least 78 civilians have lost their lives due to the fighting in Khartoum area since the beginning of September. Meanwhile, Israel's military has announced it struck, that it struck Hezbollah's intelligence headquarters in Beirut while troops engaged militants near the border and warplanes targeted strongholds across Lebanon. This week, Israel began ground raids into a southern Lebanon Hezbollah stronghold following an extensive bombing campaign in areas controlled by the group. The recent airstrikes have reportedly killed over 1,000 people, according to Lebanon's health ministry, and displaced hundreds of thousands in a nation already facing severe economic and political crisis. Israel, which has been at war in Gaza since Hamas' October 7 attack, is now focusing on securing its northern border and facilitating the return of over 60,000 people displaced by Hezbollah assaults over the past year. Meanwhile, Israel has urged the evacuation of over 20 villages and the city of Nabatie. Meanwhile, Iran summoned the German and Austrian ambassadors following their government's criticisms of the Islam, Islamic Republic's missile attack on Israel. This action was described as a response to what Iran deemed unacceptable measures by the two countries. Moving on, head of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Somalia, Jim Swan, has reaffirmed the UN's commitment to supporting Somalia as it navigates significant challenges, including upcoming elections. Speaking at a Security Council meeting on Thursday, Swan emphasized the UN's dedication to assisting Somalia in overcoming technical, logistical, and other hurdles, while also mobilizing financial support from donors to ensure timely and credible elections. Somalia's Foreign Affairs Minister Ahmed Moalim Fiki Ahmed welcomed the announcement, expressing eagerness to collaborate on a new mission over the next two years, focusing on a graduate transition to a UN country team and addressing the priorities outlined in Somalia's letter to the Council in August 2024. The United Nations is committed to supporting Somalia as it addresses technical, logistical, and other challenges and mobilizes financial support from donors in order to deliver timely and credible elections. Look forward to working together on a new mission for the next two years on gradual transition to UN country team and achieving the priorities articulated in Somalia's letter to the Council in August 2024. The growing risk of infiltration and collaboration between Al-Shabaab and the Houthi is a considerable security challenge threatening regional stability in the Horn of Africa as well as maritime navigation and shipping routes in the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean and the Channel of Mozambique. The country is currently engaged in an offensive against the jihadist group of Al-Shabaab, which has executed a series of bombings throughout Somalia over the past 17 years. Additionally, Somalia is involved in a dispute with Ethiopia regarding a Somaliland port. Still on the foreign scene, European Court of Justice has ruled that nationality and gender are sufficient grounds for an EU country to grant asylum to Afghan women whose rights have been severely curtailed under Taliban rule. Since taking power in Afghanistan in 2021, the, Afghanistan, the Taliban has enforced a strict interpretation of Islam progressively pushing women out of the public life. Women have faced severe, restriction, severe restrictions that the United Nations has described as gender apartheid. This ruling follows a case in which Austrian authorities denied refugee status to two Afghan women who subsequently challenged the decision at Austria's Supreme Administrative Court, which referred the case to EU's highest court. The ECJ determined that the discriminatory measures imposed by the Taliban on women constitute acts of persecution 
justifying the recognition of refugee status, it stated that member states do not need to approve that an individual applicant is at specific risk of persecution upon returning to Afghanistan. Sweden, Finland and Denmark have already granted ref refugee status to all Afghan women seeking asylum. And now on Talking Sports, Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Eno has emphasized the need for efficiency from the Secretary General of various national sports federations. Senator Eno stated this at a meeting with the secretaries in Abuja. Our Abuja sport editor Samuel Adeliki has details of this and more. Senator Eno reminded them that they are civil servants first responsible for ensuring that the activities of the federations align with the best interest of both the ministry and the nation. So you don't expect the same level of funding for a sporting federation that is category A and then category D. But I'm not too sure that's the way we have conducted in the last one year. We just get files anyhow. We get requests anyhow. The meeting was attended by the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry, Mrs. Tinuke Wati, as well as directors, senior staff, and all secretaries of national sports federations. Meanwhile, Nigeria's Flamingos have arrived at their training camp in Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, for a two-week intensive preparation ahead of the 2024 FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup Finals, scheduled from 16th October to 3rd November. The Flamingos are placed in Group A alongside host country Dominican Republic, Ecuador and New Zealand. They will kick off their campaign against New Zealand on October 16, followed by a match against Ecuador on October 19, and we conclude their preliminary assignments against the host country three days later. Steam football, Rangers International and Remo Stars head coaches Fidel Isile Chuku and Daniel Ogumodede will lead the Super Eagles' home base team as they begin preparations for the Championship of African Nations, Chan qualifiers this month. Super Eagles interim coach Osuna Guavoin will take on a supervisory role to ensure a successful outing. Coach Guavoin who also serves as the NFF technical director, clarified this arrangement in an interview with Newsman. The first round of the Chan qualifiers is set for 25th to 27th October, with the draw scheduled for next week. In more sporting news, league leaders Remonstars of Ikene will visit Quara United this weekend as the Nigeria Premier Football League enters March Day 5. Remonstars currently sit atop the table with 12 points, having won all four of their games so far. They are in a confident mood as they face a Quara United team that has recorded just two draws from four matches. Some of the other fixtures this weekend include Lobby Stars hosting Shooting Stars in Lafia, Casino United visiting Rivers United, and Canoe Pillars clashing with Sunshine Stars. And on a sad note, the remains of late Nigerian goalkeeper Christian Obi, formerly of Atland of Oweri, will be laid to rest on 25th October. Coach Obi tragically passed away in an auto accident in August when the club's bus collided with a parked vehicle in Imo State while en route to Abakali Kiaboy State for a preseason tournament. Coach Obi notably led Atland to promotion by winning the Nigeria National League playoffs in Asaba Delta State during the 2022-2023 season. Samuel Adeleke, ADBN Television News. And that's it on ADBN TV News. Remember to watch us live on DSTV channel 258 on Star Times channel 140 on Avo TV app, Limex World TV app and Niger TV app. For more stories, visit our website on www.adbntv.com. You can also watch us live from every part of the world by logging on to www.adbntv.com slash live. I am Miriam Zakari, thanking you for watching. Have a good evening.